but without feedback, you don't see people getting better in sports. Even the best of the best need feedback, both positive. You say, oh, they're already the best in the world at their sport. Why do they need positive feedback? Do they still need people that sit there and praise when they do good? Yes, they do. And do they still need people to correct them if they're doing things wrong? Of course. The one that sticks out in my mind as far as sports goes is Pete Sampras, number one in the world for six consecutive years in tennis. And Pete comes walking in, and he wanted to do something. He wanted to change his backhand. After 15 years of doing the same backhand, he had found out through looking at tape that he was doing his back, backhand incorrectly. And there's two things, only two things he wanted to correct. Number one is he wanted to correct his elbow position. His elbow, he needed to move it about two inches from where it was. The second thing he needed to do is he needed to get his stance lower. He was doing it way too up in the air, and he wanted to get lower and put more of his bottom body into it. Okay? Two things he wanted to change. How hard is it to change a habit you've had for 15 years? Very hard. So he gets out there, and what do you think the coaches were doing every single time that he was doing a shot? Correcting him course correcting what he was doing. No, a little bit lower on the elbow. No, get a little bit lower. In fact, at one point, he was having such problem getting lower, they took a folding chair out of the office, they took it onto the court, they set it down, they said, okay, you're going to do 3,000 balls backhand sitting in this chair where you're down this low, so you know what the feeling's like when you do a backhand sitting on a chair, because that's about the height you should be when you're actually doing the backhand. And then they did another 3,000 once the chair was taken away. That's 6,000 over a period of days of him doing this to change the thing. But every single time he was getting feedback. Feedback from his coaches, feedback. And of course, an athlete like that has feedback on his diet. He has feedback on his mental state from psychologists. He's getting feedback all the time. So one of the things I remember asking Pete is, you're number one in the world, Pete. What do you think about all these people who aren't number one in the world, telling you how to do things. He says, I won't get better unless I listen to the feedback. And that's, I remember this to this day, that that's one of the things, it's two things about that stuck out. Number one is I don't care where you're at in life and where your people are at. They may be great, but they still need positive feedback and they still have to have negative feedback as well. The second thing is it's hard to change things that have been going on over and over again. If you have an employee that's perpetually doing things the same way, how do you change that behavior? It doesn't happen by just saying once. It doesn't happen by just praising once when they do it right. It's a continual process because what we're trying to do here is we're trying to change habits. We're trying to do more than just change knowledge. Okay, I'm aware of the fact that I'm doing that wrong. And all of your things that you have on your performance reviews that are on the wall over there, Every single one of those, I'm sure there's opportunities to give feedback for people, both positive and negative, throughout the day. So what is feedback? We're going to give this definition. It's information that is shared with another person for the distinct purpose, this is very important, for improving and sustaining results and relationships. That's what we want to use feedback for, improving results and improving relationships. Does that make sense? So... We look at this from a continuous improvement program here at Sharp. Kaizen, basically, if you look at the, uh, the, the Japanese word Kaizen of continuous improvement, you know, Kai means change and Zen means wisdom. So basically what they're trying to do is use wisdom to do, make changes. But they weren't trying to make huge changes. What they wanted to do is have each individual employee from the person who was sweeping the floor of the factory to the, to the CEO to give around 60 to 70 ideas of improvement for their own jobs and other people's jobs throughout the year. Now look at Toyota. One person didn't come up with an idea that was necessary. And it, look at the, the, the change that's happening because of not looking at that as a continuous improvement status. We talk about this in corporate America as monkey traps that people get into. Something's being, you know, you ever heard of the South, South Indian monkey traps? You know, monkeys basically take over villages in India. And what they want to do is they want to move the monkeys. They don't want to kill the monkeys. They just want to move them. They want to get them out because they create quite a mess. And so what happens is, is that they need to catch them. The easiest way to catch them is to take like coconuts or some sort of a gourd. They hollow it out and they put rice or something the monkey likes inside of it. So the monkey goes up. He smells the coconut. He smells the rice. He wants the rice. He puts his hand inside. And they put a hole in the coconut. The hole is big enough for him to put his hand in. But once he grabs the rice, he can't get it out because he has a fist. And what happens is the monkey freezes. 
He doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know if he wants freedom without rice or rice without freedom. And so he sits there, and they calmly come up, they gather up in a burlap sack, they put them into a truck, they drive them out in the jungle, and they release the monkeys. I think there's a lot of monkeys in corporate America. And because of the fact that we look at things that if we don't improve, if we don't have a continuous improvement, we won't be able to keep up with our competitors, with what our customers' needs are. And we need to constantly be looking at how do we improve and not get stuck in that thing that we keep doing over and over again, expecting different results. And I know one of the things I always ask people when I'm going into a corporation to do work is, well, why do you do it that way? I mean, I'm an outsider. Why do you do things that way? And guess what my number one response I get from corporations is? We've always done it that way. And that's how we get into these habits of being able to do these. So what we want to do with feedback is we want to basically break as a culture and say we need to have continuous improvement every single day, every single minute. Because that's going to put us, if we just make a small shift in thought, a small shift in behavior, think about all your, all your group. I remember reading about the Los Angeles Lakers. I was a huge Lakers fan. Magic Johnson used to go watch him play when, uh, I, was in, uh, when I was in high school. Uh, he was in college. And I went to go see Magic Johnson, and he went on to play for the Lakers. And so I became a huge Lakers fan back in Michigan. And I remember one year, they didn't do as well. They had won a couple championships. They kind of had a letdown year. And Pat Riley, the coach, came in. He says, do you guys realize that if each one of you improves by 1%, in the next year in six major areas of basketball, rebounding, just 1%. If everyone improves by 1% statistically, we will be the dominant team in basketball. We don't need everybody to go out there and become 10% better. This organization is going to become the leader of excellence in your, in your field by only having small changes. But what happens is that small change is then just small changed again and small changed again and small changed again. And so you start off making very minor changes and that's where the feedback comes in. You have to constantly reinforce those changes and you have to constantly correct because sometimes we go back to where we used to be.